I'm reading from Romans 1, verse 24 to 32. So, God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded a truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the Creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things observe, uh, deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we have a challenging passage of Scripture this morning. What we read last week led right up to where we started. And last week it says that God's anger is being revealed against sin. And then it continues in what we read today, giving many examples. So sin and God's anger are not the most popular topics, but they are necessary for us to learn about. So along the way, we're talking about sin and God's anger. We also talk about sex and sexuality because they're also in the passage. That one people do tend to be more interested in. And here's the thing, along the way, as we, as we look at these ideas, these topics, we will see that there is good news mixed in all the way. That even when we talk about God's anger, there is something good in God's anger. Even when we talk about our human capacity to commit sin, there is good news mixed in when we hear that bad news. Last week, uh, we said that a work of art tells you something about the artist, their skill, their imagination, their creativity, and the world we live in tells us something about its creator, his imagination and power and wisdom to imagine such a world and to make it exist in reality. So you could say, and people do say, that everything exists by a random chance, but does that really make more sense than saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? I've actually had conversations with people who are atheist or agnostic, and they say, what you're describing sounds appealing just because it's so much more interesting than what I believe. In a world that is empty and has no meaning. Now, if we believe in God, then, I mentioned this last week, come to believe in God, you might then pretty soon say, we're in trouble. Because it's clear to us that the kinds of things that God wants us to do, we do not always do. 
and things that we know God would not like to be done, we have done. So five things I would like to say about sin and God's anger. The first is about justice about right and wrong, good and bad. And this is where I would say the good news begins as we talk about these topics. There are people who object to the idea of God being angry and say, if God is loving and good, then how could we think of God being angry? I don't see how it fits, how it fits that God would affirm people and build people up. God would not condemn. And this is really one of the main objections, main questions people have when they hear uh, uh, the, about the beliefs that we have as Christians. How could a good and loving God be angry? Now, I would just give some examples of some things that have happened in the history of the world. Adolf Hitler had six million people killed because they were Jewish. Another 200,000 killed because they were disabled and considered useless to society. Islamic State, which is still, still in existence, has taught people that it was acceptable and pleasing to God to rape women who do not belong to their religion. In the United States, from the 1500s to the 1800s, over 300 years, 12 and a half million people were shipped as slaves. And this history of racism still has a shadow over the whole country. We could go on and on. Everybody knows about priests whose job was to serve God, but who committed terrible crimes against children. And virtually every person who hears about these things today would say, that is wrong. To murder people because they are different ethnicity or nationality or religion. To violate other people's rights as human beings, that that is wrong. We can only say that there is justice, that there is right and wrong, there is good and evil, if we agree that there is such a thing as sin. That there is a God who has a will and a design for how we live as human beings. And the good news is that we can say, yes, those things are wrong. Everybody knows deep down and says those things are wrong and they should not be done. The reason we can say that is because there is a God who has a will and a design for how we live as human beings. So this, what we read about sin and God's anger is good news to those who desire justice. There is such a thing as justice. What if God wasn't angry about the murder of six million people? Could God be trusted? Could God be served if he looked at a world where these things happen and God said, well, I'm just neutral. Well, whatever happens, happens. No, we are glad to know that God sees the atrocities, the horrible things that happen, and God is deeply angry. Because that tells us that God is just. And God cares for what is good and right. There's a man, uh, he's become a professor of theology. His name is Miroslav Volf. He came from Yugoslavia. And he used to think that God could not be angry, that it didn't fit with God's character. To say that God is loving, but he couldn't be angry. He used to believe that until his country, his own city, was torn apart by war. 
and hundreds of thousands of people were killed, and three million people were forced to leave their homes because of a war. And he said the kind of atrocities that happened, the kind of brutality, if, we, if, I, if I mentioned the things this morning, you would be so shocked, it'd be hard to focus again on a sermon. And he said, when that happened, then he realized what the Bible says about God and God's anger makes sense. That he couldn't believe in a God who does not get angry because there is evil in the world. And God must not accept evil things. So it is good news that God is angry over the evil in the world because it means that there is right and wrong. It means that we can say this is evil and it should not be done. So another question that people would then have is, if God is so angry about evil, then why does he let it happen at all? A good question, but this leads us into the next part of the good news, really, about sin and God's anger. In the passage we read, it repeats three times over that people exchanged the truth about God for something less. Exchanged the glory of God. Instead of serving the Creator, they served created things. It says people exchanged the truth of God for a lie. The people exchanged the design for sex and made it into something other than it was supposed to be, something less than it was supposed to be. And three times it says God gave the people over. In the translation that, that Drini read for us, it says God abandoned them to their desires. This is like uh, some people's approach to raising children. This is, I think, mostly a good approach. Your kid wants to go outside without wearing a coat. You say, it's cold, put on a jacket. He says, no, I don't want to wear a jacket. Well, you can have the fight about wearing the jacket, or you can say, okay, fine, go outside. They go outside without a jacket, they get cold. You're letting them experience the consequences of their own desires. The same kind of logic is what it is saying here, that, that uh, people choose to exchange the truth of God for a lie, and God says, okay, you can live without me. People say, I do not want to submit to God and His will and His design for me. I would rather do my own thing, and God says, you can do that. This is also, in a sense, good news for us because what it means is that God gives us the dignity of making real choices. This is an amazing thing that God gives us as human beings the ability to choose how we will live, what we will do, so that we can make this choice about what we will, well, whether we will listen to God or not listen to God. I also want to mention, as we're, as we're here on this, uh, because the passage mentions sex and sexuality very clearly. So I want to say uh, just a, a few things about this. And one is that God did not discover and was, God was not surprised that people were having sex and then said, oh, I better make some rules to make it less enjoyable or something like that. Sex was God's idea, God's design. And what people have done with sex is the same that they've done with every other gift that God has given, changed it into something else less than what it is meant to be. Now, the Apostle Paul is writing this. He came from a Jewish background. They had a pretty strong sexual ethic and understanding of sex, that it's, be, it's uh, within marriage. And so as a religious people, they looked at the world around them, the Greek world, and they saw all sorts of sexual mess. And this is what he's uh, writing about. It's not actually that much different than things today. 
there's all sorts of things, all sorts of ways that sex is misused and is creating problems in our world today. Now the secret, and not very many people know this, but Christianity is the key to the best sex. Seriously. According to people's studies, they say that people who are the most sexually active and the most sexually satisfied are married people who are involved in their church. There's a reason for this. God designed sex. God has a plan for where it is meant to be enjoyed and celebrated. And that is within the promise, the covenant, the commitment that we call marriage. That when there is commitment and there is trust, the intimacy of sex can be enjoyed most. But a lot of people don't want that, or they don't realize maybe that that's what they really want. And so kind of jump from one person, one experience, one shallow physical encounter to the next. And God says, okay, you can do that if you please. But there is another better way. The passage in Romans also mentions homosexuality, and this is a big topic in our world today, especially in the United States and America. I just read an article this week in a magazine called Christianity Today about a woman who describes herself as homosexual, and she became, she became drawn to Jesus and eventually gave her life to Jesus. And she said she still was attracted to other women, and she was in this kind of struggle to figure out what she should do. But she decided she should trust God, and trust God's word, even though she didn't understand it. She didn't understand why she had the desires she had, why God's word says sex is intended for within a marriage, between a man and a woman, but she decided she would uh, do her best. She ended up with a, a man who was interested in her, and they began to date, and she started to think, well, uh, she wasn't immediately attracted to this man. But this is where, if we understand the deeper sort of meaning of sex and what it's about, things begin to make sense. She said she had, she realized that she could be attracted to this man physically, but it was more something she had to learn. And when we understand that sex is about more than just physical attraction, it is about two people becoming one within commitment and promise, and that's then within that is this great expression of intimacy. She married this man, and they've been married for 10 years. She said she still sometimes finds herself attracted to other women, but she loves her husband more, and she loves Jesus more, and she trusts Jesus more. I share this to say there is a design for sex that God has built into the world, and when we find that design, we find that it is good. But it requires watching temptations. It requires learning and relearning the way to think about men and women and sex and intimacy and all of these things. The end of the passage we read, it lists a whole, a whole list of things. Greed and envy, murder, deception, gossip, betrayal. This is how many people choose to live. Many people choose to live this way. Choose to be somebody who gossips. Choose to be somebody who betrays another person. And God says, you can choose that. The consequence is, the consequence of sin is living in a sinful world. 
And it's a rough place to be, isn't it? You can choose to live this way, and the life that you live is itself the consequence. It's not God's anger is not shown so much in God intervening in the world. It's that God doesn't intervene, and He lets us have what we want. There's a, uh, it's kind of a novel or a, a really long poem actually called Paradise Lost written by a man named Milton. And in this, he's imagining Satan being cast out of heaven for rebelling against God. And Satan says when he arrives in hell, he says to himself and to the other spirits that have joined him, he says, better to reign here than to submit in heaven. It's better to be in charge here than it is to submit to God and be in His presence. Which is an expression of great pride. To say, I'd rather have my own way, even if it means being here. I'd rather do this than accept God as God. This is what we see in Romans 1. God gives us the freedom to choose. So that in the end, and this is from a book by C.S. Lewis called The Great Divorce. He says, in the end, there are two kinds of people. The people who say to God, thy will be done. People who submit to God and say, I want what you want. I want your will. And the other kind of people are the people to whom God says, Thy will be done. That God lets people have what they want. And if people want to be separated from God, God says, your will be done. And that is the punishment in itself. So I said there's good news that there is right and wrong. There is justice. There is morality. There's other good news that... Uh, we get this uh, ability to choose. Uh, there is justice, there is right and wrong in the world. The bad part of that is that the justice of God finds us too. That if we examine our own lives, and it's very easy to make judgments about other people, other times, other places in history, but if we examine our own lives, our own hearts, we realize there are things that I have done too. The good news in this is equality. There is no group of people that can say we're better because we were born in the right place, we were born into the right family, we had the right education. There is no group of people that can say just by nature we are better. Every person is equal before God, but equal in our sinfulness. The good part of this, Paul points this out here and plenty of other places in the Bible, he says, therefore there is no boasting, there is no pride, there's simply no room for it because we all come to God not based on our own goodness, but based on His grace. And this is a good thing. This is what equalizes everybody throughout the world. The fourth thing that is good in all this is, well, when you go to the doctor, you want the doctor to give an accurate diagnosis. And if the doctor knows what is going on, you want the doctor to tell you the truth. And sometimes they hesitate a little bit because they don't want you to, to, to freak out, right? This happened with us, with our own son Peter. They said, first, there's a mass in his chest. And so then we're left with the question, well, what does that mean? And Rebecca had to ask the doctor, could it be anything besides cancer? Then the doctor said, no. 
it's cancer. Well, if you are, these questions we're asking, is there a God? Is there such a thing as sin? Is God angry over evil in the world? How can I be right with God? These are even more important than, than the things you, uh, the doctor tells you. And we want an accurate diagnosis. We want to hear the truth. And it is good to hear the truth. It wakes you up. It makes you change your life. It makes you discover after being aware of your own sinfulness, then you also discover the goodness of God, the kindness and the love of God. There are other answers. People have other ideas of what's wrong in the world. If you ask somebody who's a communist, they'll say, economic inequality is what's wrong in the world. There are rich and there are poor. And the solution, therefore, is to redistribute and have a new economic policy. There are other people, capitalists, who say, the problem is that we need more freedom so that people can do business. That's how people will be better off. You ask probably the average uh, European, just a lot of average Americans, what's wrong with the world? They will say, people need more education. That would solve the world's problems. I had a professor who was a, uh, living in the country of Chile at a time when uh, there was a lot of communist uh, political movement. And he said his, his uh, criticism of the, of the communists was, and he would tell them, you're not radical enough. They were saying, we want to overthrow society, we want to do everything new. And he said, no, you're not radical enough because none of that gets to the human heart. According to Christianity, according to the Word of God, what's wrong with the world is not out there, it's in here. There's an English author named G.K. Chesterton who wrote a two-word response to a, a, a newspaper that asked for an essay about this question, what is wrong with the world? And they're expecting, you know, pages of response. This author, G.K. Chesterton, he wrote back, what's wrong with the world? I am. If we start there and say, what's wrong with the world? Well, there are plenty of things wrong in the world. But the thing that I can bring before God is what's wrong in me. This is the truth. There are things wrong in me. There is a God who hates evil. God is angry about evil. And he should be. It is also the truth that you are a sinful human being and there is no need to compare yourself to other people. It's enough to know that you need God's forgiveness. You don't need to say I'm better or worse, just I stand before God and I know I need His forgiveness. We're equal in this, but this is also the truth. God loves you. And Jesus died for you. Next week, we're going to baptize several people. Baptism represents death and resurrection. Being united with Jesus in His death and resurrection. Well, we also will celebrate communion together. Communion is about the death and the resurrection of Jesus and His invitation to take part and say, I believe in this. And both of them speak to us about the love of God who looks at a sinful world. And this is the amazing thing. God looks at a world that is as sinful as what we have described and more. And still, God loves us. Baptism and communion point us to Jesus and His death and resurrection. Why did He die? because of our sin. And they sh it shows us that God takes sin most seriously. That His own Son died for us. But it also at the same time shows us how deeply God loves us. His own Son died for us. This is the center of Christian faith to recognize we have nothing in ourselves that would make us acceptable to God. In fact, we are sinful people. But God loves us 
even more deeply than we are needy. The last thing, the last piece of good news is that all this about sin and God's anger, God's righteousness, it leads us then to experience the grace of God, the goodness of God, the love of God. And the way to experience this is so simple. Not easy, but simple. To turn from sin and turn towards Jesus Christ. Don't wait. Do it now. Say, I am done with sin. I am dying to sin. I will need Jesus to raise me to a new life and make me into a new person. The invitation is open. Respond now. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that even in hearing hard things, there is good news for us. And we thank you that you do not hesitate to tell us the truth and to reveal the truth about ourselves, Lord, because you love us. We thank you also that you are a God who is just and righteous and that those who commit evil will be held accountable and people who have suffered evil and injustice will receive justice. But for us, Lord, we know we need your forgiveness. And so we, become, we come before you with nothing in our own advantage, nothing to recommend us to you, we have nothing but Jesus Christ. To you, Lord Jesus, we turn now. Forgive us our sins. Make us new. Make us right with God the Father. Amen.